Meet Teyu Asana, a high schooler who struggles to connect with others after a tragic car crash took his family. His only friend is Mutsumi Azakura, a top spy. But there's a catch, Mutsumi's brother, Kaiyu Akairu, is dangerously obsessed with her. To survive, Teyu must marry Mutsumi and join her spy family. Now, he's thrust into a world of chaos, becoming a spy to protect his wife and uncover secrets about his past and the Yazakura family. Without delaying any further, let's get started. A tragic event struck Teyu Asana, a high school student, when he lost his entire family in a car accident, leaving him as the sole survivor. Sitting at his family's funeral, he reflects on how people often realize the true value of something only after it's gone. Seeing his childhood friend, Matsumi Yazakura, grieving, he questions if forming bonds with loved ones will only lead to losing them. The fear of losing Matsumi, his only remaining close connection, terrifies Teo. He struggles to contain his emotions, fearing the thought of her demise. Matsumi notices his distress and reassures him, holding his hand tightly and promising she won't leave him alone. After the accident, Teo becomes withdrawn from his classmates, preferring solitude and feeling uneasy in their presence. Despite repeated invitations to join them for activities like soccer practice or karaoke, he declines each time, resembling someone playing hard to get. Despite his friend's efforts to include him, Teo remains distant, visibly distressed and on the brink of collapse. Realizing Teo's distress, his friends reluctantly back off, aware that pushing him further could worsen his condition. Determined to help him, they decide to try again another day, hoping to eventually bring him back into their social circle. Teo feels guilty for declining his friend's invitations because he doesn't dislike them at all. Actually, he's happy they asked him, but he has his own reasons for saying no. Just then, Matsumi arrives and asks Teo if he rejected his friends again. Surprisingly, Teo can easily talk to her without experiencing panic attacks. Since Teo is always busy with work, he doesn't have time to make his own meals. So, Matsumi often prepares his lunch and delivers it, making sure he doesn't skip his veggies. She expresses concern for Teo's situation and his lack of adherence to social norms, like any caring mother would. Teo is quick to remind her that she shouldn't talk like that, as she also rejected a boy despite his intelligence, good looks, and position as the soccer team captain. Matsumi brushes off Teo's remark and advises him to move on, as it would sadden their parents watching from heaven. She offers him an egg roll from the lunchbox, but before Teo can eat it, their teacher, Hurakawa, interrupts, praising the taste of the food with excessive enthusiasm. Matsumi appears irritated and questions why Hurakawa is present when he was supposed to be away for an overseas lecture. Hurakawa responds arrogantly, stating that he rescheduled his plans because he missed Matsumi's cooking so much, deciding to return home early. His behavior comes across as domineering. He continues, complimenting Matsumi's white hair streak and expressing a desire to touch her cheek. Matsumi threatens to report him for harassment, causing him to cease his inappropriate remarks momentarily. However, he remains smug and shifts his attention to Teo, instructing him to meet in his office after school. This request makes Teo nervous, but Matsumi remains silent. Once school ends, Teo heads to the vice principal's office, where he finds himself in a very awkward situation with Hurakawa. Hurakawa doesn't seem to understand personal boundaries, which makes Teo uncomfortable. To make matters worse, Hurakawa shows Teo his secret collection of photos of Matsumi on his phone, including some questionable ones. Teo feels disgusted by Hurakawa's behavior and considers reporting him. Teo's discomfort escalates when Hurakawa starts showing him childhood photos of Matsumi. Teo wonders how Hurakawa got hold of these pictures. Hurakawa claims he's been protecting Matsumi from unwanted attention citing an incident where he intervened in a confession from a third-year student. However, Teo realizes that Hurakawa's idea of protection involves violence. As expected, Hurakawa becomes hostile towards Teo out of jealousy towards his friendship with Matsumi. Teo, feeling trapped, worries for Matsumi's safety until he realizes that Hurakawa refers to her as his kid sister. Just as Teo fears for his safety, a silver-haired woman dressed like a doll suddenly appears at the window and rescues him using blinding lights. When Teo opens his eyes, he sees several unfamiliar faces looking at him. Matsumi is the first to greet him, but Teo feels disoriented and doesn't recognize the people or the place. He panics and moves away from them, asking who they are. Matsumi calmly explains that they are her siblings. The silver-haired woman who rescued Teo is Matsumi's elder sister, Futaba. Futaba introduces her other siblings, Shinzo who is skilled with technology, Shin, a professional gamer, Kengo, known for being cool, Nano, who is very shy but incredibly smart, and their guard dog, Goliath, who looks like a black cat. She reveals that they are a family of spies, a secret she had to keep hidden for over 10 years, and now feels relieved to share. 
However, Teo feels overwhelmed by this revelation. He had believed Matsumi's family were just ordinary greengrocers, dealing with vegetables like eggplants and radishes, not guns and intelligence. Teo thinks Matsumi is playing a prank on him and decides to test it by picking up one of Shinzo's guns and pretending to fire it, only to frighten himself even more. As freelance spies, their reputation is quite good. Their eldest brother, Kawakara, who turns out to be Hurakawa, is highly respected among spies and plays a crucial role in boosting their family's reputation. Despite his perverted behavior, Kawakaro is incredibly skilled in combat and intelligence, making him the top spy in their family. However, Teo is confused and asks why he was targeted by Kawakaro. The family explains that they received a tip indicating that Matsumi's life was in danger, as someone was planning to harm her. Futaba reveals that years ago, Matsumi was seriously injured in an incident involving Kawakaro. The white streak in Matsumi's hair is a reminder of the stress from that accident. Since then, Kayo Akero has been plagued by guilt and developed an abnormal obsession with Matsumi. This is why he changed his name and took a job at her school to keep a close watch on her. His obsession leads him to interfere in every aspect of Matsumi's life, despite being a monster who protects her and has tolerated Teo despite his hatred for him. Now that he has received the tip, Kayo Akero has more than enough reason to target Teo. Futaba apologizes to Teo for her brother's behavior. Suddenly, the alarm blares, indicating that Kayo Akero has returned home. The siblings assure Teo that he is safest with them, as they have set traps from the entrance to the living room where they are gathered. Despite their preparations, they acknowledge the risks, a 30% chance of success, a 42% chance of one of them needing six months to recover, and a 25% chance of the house burning down. Seeing Teo hesitate, Futaba reveals the only way he can survive is by marrying Matsumi. According to the peace treaty within their family, no member is allowed to harm another. To formalize the marriage, they must exchange the family's cherry blossom ring, worn by every member. The ring is divided into two bands, and once one gives their half to their spouse, the marriage becomes official. This action would protect Teo from Kawakaro's anger and potentially help Kawakairo move past his obsession with his sister. Teo struggles with the decision. So Matsumi steps in and declines, citing Teo's recent loss and ongoing struggle to rebuild his life. She believes it would be unfair to casually ask him to join their family. Futaba apologizes for her insensitivity, and they prepare to handle the situation when Kaiwa Kairo unexpectedly arrives and complains about feeling left out. Everyone tenses up as they didn't notice his approach. Futaba warns him to stay away from Teo, but Kaiwa Kairo declares war, vowing not to relent until Teo is proven innocent. Fed up, Futaba grabs Kaiwa Kairo by his tie and slams him onto the couch. Despite Nanao and Shinzo's attempts to overpower him, Kaiwa Kairo proves too strong. He threatens to destroy the house unless they hand over Teo, wielding his weapon, Steel Spider. Kengo quickly escorts Teo and Matsumi to safety. As Futaba engages Kaiwa Kairo in battle, he quickly ensnares her with Steel Spider. Shin attempts to stall him with gaming attacks and projectiles, giving Kengo and Matsumi time to escape to a hidden chamber. Before closing the door, Matsumi smiles and assures him that she will not leave. Kaiwa Kairo soon arrives and sees through Matsumi's disguise, reminding her she needs to work on her technique. Teo watches everything from his hidden chamber, feeling helpless. Matsumi tries to persuade Kaiwa Kairo to give up his aggression, and he agrees not to harm Teo. However, he demands Matsumi stay in the house to avoid trouble, forbidding her from using the internet, returning to school, seeing friends, or pursuing romance. He aims to restrict her freedom to keep her safe, which Matsumi reluctantly accepts. As Kaiwa Kairo approaches for a hug, Matsumi's blade pierces his flesh, but he remains unfazed. Matsumi agrees to his terms, prompting Teo to intervene and demand Kaiwa Kairo release her. However, Kaiwa Kairo ignores him. Teo understands Kaiwa Kairo's fear of losing a loved one but realizes it shouldn't lead to that loved one fearing him the most. He suggests they proceed with the first plan Futaba proposed, trusting Matsumi's promise not to leave. Matsumi agrees and throws the upper band of her ring toward Teo, but Kaiwa Kairo intercepts it with his threats. Despite Teo's hand getting cut as he grabs the ring, he's determined to protect Matsumi. Teo pledges to safeguard her and calls Kaiwa Kairo bro as he wears the bloodied ring. Matsumi rushes to hug Teo, and her siblings arrive to celebrate their union. Futaba taunts a stunned Kaiwa Akero, indicating that it's now his turn to teach Teo how to protect Matsumi. Now known by his last name Yazakura, everyone addresses him by his first name, Teo. After the eventful evening, Teo is eager to return home and get some sleep. Matsubai expresses concern about him heading home alone, but Teo reassures her he'll be fine. However, he's worried about Kyo, who has lost all color in his body. 
Futaba assures him that Kyo is okay. He's just struggling to accept the loss of his sister. As Teo arrives home, he still finds it hard to believe what happened. Exhausted, he collapses onto his bed. Upon waking, he sees Kyo standing over him with a knife, poised to strike. Acting on reflex, Teo dodges, impressing Kyo. However, Teo questions why Kyo is in his room so early and why he's armed with a knife. Kyo brushes off Teo's concerns, claiming he's there to give Teo the traditional Yasukira family wake-up call, although Teo finds morning calls usually less lethal. Kyo defends his actions by stating that a spy must always be prepared to handle threats, teaching Teo to be vigilant. But the next part is purely for revenge. Meanwhile, downstairs, Matsumi is happily preparing a bento box for Teo when she hears his voice. She goes upstairs to greet him, only to find him being manipulated by Kyo. Confused, Matsumi asks what's happening. Kayo explains they're just engaging in some morning exercise. Unimpressed, Matsumi doesn't appreciate Kayo's actions, causing him to relent temporarily. However, Kayo interrupts, indicating they're running out of time. He grabs Matsumi and drags Teo out of the window just before the building explodes. Teo is left with many questions about the sudden explosion at his house, but Kyo assures him that he'll explain everything later. For now, he emphasizes the importance of their mission, protecting Matsumi Yasukira at all costs. Recognizing the danger posed by the explosion's attention, Kyo urges them to leave. As they depart, Matsumi calls for Teo to join them. In a limo, Kyo finishes a call with Shinzo, who has analyzed the explosion site and discovered a bomb planted in the kitchen. Teo is puzzled as to why there would be a bomb in his house if Kyo wasn't involved, but it's evident that Matsumi was the target. Word spreads quickly in the spy world especially when someone vents about losing his sister on social media. However, Teo still doesn't understand why Matsumi is being targeted. Kiyo explains that it's because she is the 10th head of the Yazakura family. The Yazakura lineage dates back to the Edo period, with generations of ninjas. While many family members possess superhuman ability, there is always one ordinary person born into the family known as the head. Although the head lacks superhuman ability, their children inherit the abilities of the Yazakura gene pool. Therefore, the superhuman family protects the head, ensuring the continuity of the Yazakura lineage. However, as her siblings, they prioritize Matsumi's freedom to live her own life. However, Matsumi counters that all her siblings are risking their lives to protect her, so she must fulfill her role as the family head as well. Kaido is moved to tears by his sister's sense of duty, but he struggles to accept her marriage to Teo. Despite his personal frustrations, Kaido further explains that Matsumi will eventually have to make her debut as the head of the Yazakura family. But before then, her mission is to gather as much knowledge about the ordinary world as possible, which also exposes her to various villains who aim to destroy the Yazakura family. As an example of the dangers they face, a black van begins tailing them and fires an RPG. However, the limo swiftly maneuvers out of harm's way. Inside, Teo panics and questions what's happening but the men in black calmly ready their assault rifles and return fire. Although Teo is alarmed, the others remain composed, accustomed to such situations. Furthermore, the car's bulletproof exterior ensures their safety. Kyo activates the car's suit-up engine to outpace the attackers, resulting in a turbulent ride. He requests smoother driving to avoid spilling his tea, but the driver, revealed to be the family dog Goliath, adds to Teo's distress. Goliath skillfully evades an RPG with another drift, causing Matsumi to bump into Teo. At that moment, Kayo decides to end the chase and leaps onto the roof, prompting the attackers to open fire despite recognizing him. After Kiyo finishes speaking, he re-enters the car and reiterates that the primary mission of the Yazakura family is to ensure Matsumi's safety from any danger, which now extends to Teo as he's part of the family. Teo is tasked with protecting Matsumi, and to aid him, Kaido will train him in the fundamentals of being a spy. Pulling out a gun, Kaido informs Teo that his first mission is to keep Matsumi safe from the assassins targeting her today. Later, they arrive at school, and Matsumi greets her classmates as usual. However, Asana rushes in and searches the room for potential threats, causing concern among the others. As Teo's potential friends approach him, he remains withdrawn. Before leaving the limo, Teo hesitates to take the gun. Kiyo reassures him that even if he were to use it, the family would handle the consequences. Despite this, Teo declines the offer. Matsumi intervenes, expressing her disapproval of offering Teo a gun, which Kiyo misconstrues as understanding him. Matsumi clarifies that assassins typically use poison, or explosives, rendering a gun ineffective. Kiyo concedes her point but argues that having a gun may still provide Teo with peace of mind. Teo's mission is to defend Matsumi from a notorious bomber named Temiya. 
Despite having collaborated with Temia in the past, Hio emphasizes the lack of loyalty among spies, warning Teo to trust no one. Despite his flaw of being addicted to social media, Tamiya tends to post about his jobs and targets online. Kaio would have preferred to accompany Teo, but he has hostages to rescue, so he advises Teo to remain vigilant because Tamiya is known for his twisted methods. Tamiya typically starts with minor bombs to lower one's guard before deploying his more potent specialty bombs. Meanwhile, Teo searches the classroom but finds nothing suspicious. However, he realizes that Matsumi may still be in danger as Tamiya could have already infiltrated the school. Upon receiving an update from Tamiya's page about the second bomb, Teo panics and begins searching the entire school. He notices a suspicious individual in the building and rushes to investigate. As he approaches the infirmary to search for the bomb, he is caught off guard by the nurse, who asks if he needs assistance. Teo feels uneasy but brushes it off when the nurse asks if he's okay. However, her unsettling smile makes him uneasy. When he looks back, she's gone, and a note on the door states the nurse is absent. Meanwhile, Matsumi enjoys lunch with her friends who discuss rumors of UFO sightings and a mysterious 3-meter-tall figure. Unbeknownst to them, these are Matsumi's family members watching over her. Teo feels overwhelmed as Tamiya's social media indicates the planting of another bomb, yet he hasn't found the second one. Taking a moment to observe Matsumi, he notices she never eats immediately and avoids being alone, showing her vigilance despite her cheerful demeanor. Suddenly, Teo's friends offer him a chocolate but they're surprised when he simply accepts it instead of feeling overwhelmed, as he usually would. Teo realizes he forgot about his severe social anxiety due to his concern for Matsumi, but it quickly resurfaces. His friends consider taking him to the infirmary, but they remember the nurse is absent, so they turn to Matsumi for help. Later, Teo wakes up in Kyo's office with Matsumi beside him. He asks if she's sure about marrying someone like him, considering he knows little about her family or her position as the head, and that she's in danger. Matsumi chides him for being negative, mentioning he's the one who got the short end of the stick, marrying into a family of spies with the constant threat to her life. Despite all this, she's always wanted Teo as her husband, so she's thrilled he married her. Teo was about to speak, but then he spots a bomb planted in the ceiling, and moments later, it detonates. He manages to shield Matsumi from harm, but he's baffled as to how Tamiya knew they'd be in that office. It dawns on him that Tamiya has been orchestrating events to target Matsumi through Teo's movements, unbeknownst to him. Realizing he might be used to target her again, Teo hurriedly unbuttons his shirt and discovers a bomb attached to it, likely planted during gym class. Tamiya's continued postings about bombs ensured Teo stayed close to Matsumi for protection. Despite the blocked exit, Teo propels himself through a hole in the wall to shield Matsumi from the blast. Thankfully, Kaio arrives in time to rescue Teo, having just completed his own mission. He commends Teo's quick thinking in identifying the bomb and notes its simplicity as its flaw, allowing a wire to disable its detonation. Once the immediate danger has passed, they settle back down, and Teo raises the question of what to do with the still active bomb. The logical course of action would be to return it to its owner, and convenient, other family members have already located him. Learning that it was Teo's inaugural mission, they all pitched in to assist him. Kaio takes charge, restraining Tamiya who pleads for leniency, but none is granted. Tamiya is launched hundreds of feet into the air, and when Kaio releases the wire controlling the explosive, Tamiya meets a fiery demise. Yet, even in his final moments, he manages to post a farewell message on social media. With that matter settled, the issue of Teo's homelessness arises, given that his house was destroyed. Matsumi proposes that he reside in the Yazakura household, despite Kyo's objections. Nonetheless, as Teo's husband, Kyo has no authority to deny him shelter, though he doesn't refrain from issuing threats. The following morning, Asano wakes from a nightmare where he witnesses Matsumi's abduction. Feeling groggy upon waking, he accidentally steps on the dog's tail, receiving a love bite as a result. Matsumi quickly tends to his wound and plays with the dog to distract him from the distressing dream. Determined to prevent his nightmare from becoming reality, Asano approaches Fuda and implores her to train him to become stronger. He expresses his desire to protect Matsumi from harm, recalling how he narrowly saved her last time with sheer luck and Hayes's assistance. Fuda dismisses his notion that strength can be attained quickly through emotion, illustrating her own rigorous training regime since childhood. She offers him the opportunity to join the intensive Yazakura training program, cautioning that it will require dedication and time. As excited as Asano is, Fuda adds the condition that he must stay at the Yazakura household for a month before the real training begins. Initially thinking it would be simple, Asano is caught off guard when a trapdoor activates beneath him, revealing deadly spikes. Fuda explains that the Yazakura household is rigged with traps for spy training, 
making survival a challenge. Despite the danger, she promises to continue his training if he can endure the trials ahead. The following morning, he awakens to the piercing alarm from an exceedingly unattractive bird. Due to oversleeping, he finds himself amidst chaos as a bomb detonates within his room. Somehow managing to escape the smoke-filled room, he inadvertently triggers another trap, a flamethrower, emerging behind him and igniting everything in its path as he dashes down the hallway. Finally reaching the breakfast table, Matsumi tends to his injuries. Curious, he inquires how she avoids the traps. She explains that the traps do not activate for her, surprising him. Shin clarifies that the traps are computer-controlled, and once someone successfully navigates and disables them all, they are accepted as a house member by the computer, granting them the ability to activate or deactivate the traps. She further explains that typically, it takes about two years for someone to clear all the traps, which is quite a long time. Before he can protest, he begins to feel discomfort in his stomach. Fuda explains that the food in the house contains a small amount of poison to build immunity, causing gastrointestinal issues, but not fatal harm. Rushing to the bathroom, he finds it locked, requiring him to pick locks and decipher codes for entry. From that day forward, Asano's grueling daily routine commences. While others in the household manage to disarm the explosive bird before it detonates, Asano repeatedly falls prey to its blast. The fridge is equipped with lasers, posing a hazard. However, Shin utilizes her drones, and Fuda relies on her superhuman speed to retrieve items safely. Conversely, Asano inadvertently activates the trap, triggering a barrage of machine gun fire. Turning on the TV requires shooting the power button with a gun, but the recoil proves too challenging for him, causing him to fall each time. At lunch, he struggles with the poison-laced food and deciphering the washroom codes, despite Matsumi's encouragement. Even bathing becomes a trial with the shower simulating Russian interrogation techniques, which he detests. The following day, he appears exhausted at school, burdened by a 30-kilogram shirt intended to maintain his basic strength even during rest. After a draining day, upon returning to his room, he finds Matsumi asleep at her desk. He covers her with a blanket, inspired by her diligence, then decides to practice shooting skills outside. Matsumi awakens and offers him tea advising him to take it easy since he's protected her before. She recounts an incident from high school when bullies attempted to cut her hair. Asano intervened, causing the bullies to flee, saving Matsumi from harm. He pledges to become stronger and remain by her side before retiring for the night. Weeks pass, and Asano learns to disable the birds effortlessly and navigate the laser traps, skillfully using the pistol to turn on the TV. Shinzo praises Asano's ability, but Asano admits he still struggles with changing channels. Shortly after, Shin enters the room and presents Shinzo with Asano's progress report since his arrival. Later that day, Tubhead instructs him on escaping the poison gas trap, and he manages to endure the basic poison food. However, upon trying the milk, he falls ill again and rushes to the washroom, only to be thwarted by the access codes. Concerned, they find him nearly unconscious on the floor. Fuda rushes him to the infirmary for examination, discovering he has a fever from exhaustion. Upon closer inspection, they find he's wearing a fake bodysuit, concealing his battered and bruised state from rigorous training. To spare Matsumi worry, he requested the disguise while recovering. Impressed by his exceptional progress, Fuda advises him to rest and provides a book on coding. She insists he complete it before resuming training. After a week, he successfully cracks the washroom locks, marking his acceptance as a Yazakura house member by the computer. However, his relief is short-lived as Shinzo presents a 100 kg shirt, signaling an increase in training intensity. As Shin elevates trap difficulty from normal to hard, Asano realizes his journey has only just begun, understanding he has much to learn before he can protect himself and Matsumi from all dangers. The next morning, Matsumi prepares breakfast as usual, while Asano clumsily attempts to put on her undergarments. She shoots him a disapproving look, commenting on his strange behavior and assuring him that, despite his odd fantasy, she won't divorce him. Asano insists it's all a misunderstanding, explaining he's just practicing his disguises. Suddenly, a stunning blonde woman enters the kitchen, asking if everything is alright. Asano is puzzled, but Matsumi recognizes it's Kengo in disguise. Kengo playfully bothers Asano, but Matsumi intervenes, telling him to stop and leave Asano alone. Hais then appears, requesting a goodbye kiss from Matsumi before leaving. Overwhelmed, Matsumi reprimands both Kengo and Hais with a smack on their heads. Later that day, Asano meets Shinzo, who is preparing to embark on a solo mission. Asano inquires about the mission's danger level, but Shinzo assures him it's low risk, involving gathering information on a counterfeit money operation, and shouldn't take much time. Asano wishes Shinzo luck and heads to school with Matsumi. 
While walking towards the school building, a ball hurtles towards Asano at high speed, but he instinctively catches it and effortlessly throws it back with remarkable strength. Later, during lunchtime, Asano and Matsumi go to the roof to eat. Matsumi mentions to Asano that he may not realize it, but his strength and skills have noticeably improved due to his training. His footsteps have become so quiet that people now jokingly call him a ninja. Matsumi then asks if Asano is available after school to assist her with some work. Asano agrees, and when they return home, Matsumi assigns him various tasks related to paperwork. As Asano brings more documents, Matsumi swiftly analyzes them and identifies errors. She designates Asano as her personal assistant and instructs him to send emails to investors to boost their stocks. While sorting through the files, Matsumi notices a report by Kengo that appears to be incomplete. Angered by Kengo's repeated negligence, Matsumi takes Asano to Kengo's room, which is overflowing with clothes. Matsumi demands that Kengo complete his report immediately, and he miraculously emerges from atop the pile of clothes to fulfill her request. Kengo dismisses Matsumi's seriousness and continues eating his sushi, telling her to stop acting like an overprotective grandmother. Matsumi becomes furious and grabs her handcuffs to enforce punishment in the Yazakura style. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Kengo swiftly escapes the room by leaping out of the mound of clothes. Asano, having honed his speed through training, blocks Kengo's path. However, Kengo outsmarts him by impersonating Matsumi, causing Asano to lower his guard. Seizing the opportunity, Kengo rushes past him and activates the house's hibernation mode to seal it off completely from the outside world, erecting giant walls around the property. Matsumi informs Asano that once this mode is activated, there is no way to escape the house. Meanwhile, Shinzo infiltrates the premises by navigating through the air vents. He discovers a large-scale operation led by a millionaire who has circulated 60% of the counterfeit currency. Traveling through the ducts, Shinzo realizes that the operation involves highly intelligent individuals who have devised intricate safety measures. Utilizing his Apple Vision Pro glasses, Shinzo gains valuable insights, enabling him to identify containers holding fake money. He descends through a hatch and successfully hacks into a secret case, retrieving a frame note that appears to hold significant importance. However, before he can investigate further, an alarm is triggered, prompting him to flee the scene. Back at the Yazakura house, Matsumi meticulously checks each room, scanning for any signs of Kengo's presence. She enters her own room and employs an infrared device to detect any hidden traces, but finds nothing. As Asano observes, he admires Matsumi's diverse array of hobby, noticing a recent painting she completed. Next, they visit Shin's room, where she is engrossed in a physical game, albeit with limited success. Moving on, they proceed to Buckethead's room, where he warns them of dire consequences for Kengo if he is found. Finally, they arrive at Hai's room, only to discover it entirely plastered with Matsumi's photograph. As Asano wonders if Kengo could have eluded them, Matsumi assures him that escape is impossible with the house under lockdown. Suddenly, the other siblings join them, inquiring about Kengo's whereabouts. Just then, Asano hears a noise and turns to see Kengo's face hidden within a picture frame of Mamelus. Kengo swiftly flees, and Asano gives chase but soon yells in surprise as he falls. Rushing over, Matsumi finds Asano on the ground, nursing his head, claiming that Kengo threw the frame at him and darted into a cavity within the wall. Matsumi concludes that Kengo must have found a means to bypass the lockdown, fueling her anger as she storms back to Kengo's room, determined to lift the lockdown. Upon entering, she swiftly handcuffs Asano, suspecting that Kengo has taken his place in a desperate bid to deceive her. Convinced of Kengo's ruse, Matsumi asserts that there is no way out of the lockdown, implying that Kengo intends to escape once she lifts the restriction. Kengo acknowledges his defeat and removes his disguise, joining Matsumi in searching for the needed paperwork. Later, Asano enjoys a delicious curry prepared by Matsumi, prompting him to inquire about the secret ingredient. To his shock, Matsumi jests that cyanide is the secret, causing Asano to feel ill and excuse himself to answer a phone call. Upon answering, he finds Shinzo on the line, urgently pleading for Matsumi's assistance. They engage in a video call, during which Shinzo tearfully recounts being caught in a gunfight without ammunition. Matsumi explains to Asano that while Shinzo is a skilled spy, he heavily relies on his weapons, rendering him vulnerable without them. She asks Asano to deliver weapons to Shinzo, to which he readily agrees. After donning appropriate attire, and carrying a bag of weapons, Asano navigates through the secure building's corridors. Unfortunately, he is intercepted by a guard who aims a gun at him. Drawing upon his training, Asano deflects the gun and swiftly subdues the guard with a series of strikes. As more guards converge on the scene, Asano employs his combat skills to fend them off, 
utilizing his surroundings to his advantage. He manages to neutralize the threats, even using a weapon provided by Shinzo to incapacitate another guard with an electric shock. Locating Shinzo, Asano is greeted with gratitude and embraces from Shinzo, who thanks him profusely for the weapons. Suddenly, additional guards arrive, prompting a swift change in Shinzo's demeanor as he eliminates them with expert marksmanship. Retrieving a framed note, Shinzo leads Asano out of the room, effortlessly dispatching more adversaries along the way. However, their escape is interrupted when Asano is shot in the leg by a sniper, causing him to collapse in pain and begin bleeding. The sniper demands that Shinzo surrender his weapons, posing a dire threat to their escape. Following Shinzo's instructions to ensure Asano's safety, he relinquishes his gun. However, Asano recalls Shinzo's resourcefulness and quickly throws a fork at him. Shinzo catches it and skillfully uses it to disable the sniper's weapon, buying them precious time. Asano seizes the opportunity to retrieve his gun and eliminate the threat, ultimately saving his own life. As night descends, Shinzo carries Asano on his back as they make their way back. Asano expresses his gratitude to Shinzo for saving his life, acknowledging that he would not have survived without him. Meanwhile, in another location, a vagrant infiltrates a facility, overpowering the guards with a hammer. Despite his efforts to extract information about their leader, the guards remain steadfast, leading to their demise. The vagrant, armed with a picture of his next target, Asano, sets off on his mission. Days later, Asano, with his leg partially healed, strolls along a street beside a quiet road, engaged in conversation with Matsumi on his cell phone. She recounts the legend of a special Ferris wheel in their city known as the Matchmaking Ferris Wheel. As they chat, she expresses her desire to spend a day with him there on their next day off suggesting that couples who watch the sunset from the Ferris wheel are destined for lasting happiness. As Matsumi's voice fades into the background, Asano notices a white sedan pulling up beside him. A disheveled man emerges from the car, his appearance unsettling. Asano locks eyes with the mysterious figure, a sense of foreboding settling over him. Matsumi notices Asano's lack of response and calls out to him. In a serious tone, Asano informs her that he needs to end the call and moves the phone away. Meanwhile, the man from the car approaches Asano, confirming his identity by using his name, which unsettles Asano. Observing the man's actions, Asano watches as he retrieves a police ID card from his coat and introduces himself as Hodo, a police officer from the Koizumi precinct. Without elaborating further, Hodo requests Asano's presence at the police station for interrogation. With little room to refuse, Asano agrees and accompanies Hodo to the police station. Inside a dimly lit interrogation room with only a small light bulb, Hodo wastes no time in presenting a photo found on the dark web. The image depicts Asano during recent altercations. Seeing the photo, Asano is deeply disturbed, realizing that it's accessible to anyone online. He questions how his photo ended up on the dark web despite assurances from the Yazakura siblings about maintaining secrecy regarding their clandestine activities. Hodo continues to display more images depicting Asano involved in various illegal activities including the use of illegal firearms, trespassing into private property, participating in a car chase on public roads where Mitsumi's pet was driving, and being present during the detonation of a ceiling bomb at his school. Asano realizes that he wasn't responsible for some of these incidents, but he remains silent when Hodo accuses him of all the crimes. Hodo expresses his skepticism, noting that a teenager couldn't orchestrate such activities alone and questions the absence of evidence implicating any accomplices. He suspects that Asano is affiliated with a covert organization engaging in these activities discreetly. Hodo offers to mitigate Asano's punishment if he provides valuable information leading to the arrest of others involved. Despite the pressure, Hodo persists in pressing Asano to divulge any secrets and expose his alleged collaborators. But Asano is aware of the consequences of betraying trust. He thinks about the Yazakura siblings, and with determination, he asserts that he doesn't know anything. Hodo advises him to calm down and consider his response carefully. Then, he offers Asano a glass of water and openly adds a white powder to it. As Asano watches, Hodo tries to justify his actions by claiming it's just added minerals. However, Asano recognizes it immediately as truth serum and refuses to drink. Despite his lack of subtlety, Hodo resorts to force and forcibly pours the liquid down Asano's throat before he can react. Fortunately, due to his training with the spy family, Asano is able to gather the liquid into a bubble and spit it out. When Hodo realizes the truth serum failed, he turns to violence, grabbing a hammer and smashing the table. As Asano reacts instinctively, he swiftly moves out of harm's way and lands on a nearby bag. Observing a red liquid seeping out of the bag, he assumes it's blood, which is confirmed by Hodo, who reveals it's from a recently deceased drug dealer. Hodo attempts to confront Asano again, 
wielding the hammer, and attempts to intimidate him into revealing information. However, Asano manages to evade his attack, causing the hammer to strike the wall instead. To his surprise, he sees Hisa grinning mischievously. It's revealed that Hodo and Hisa are old friends who collaborate to conceal the Yazakura family's activity. Asano was deliberately put through this ordeal to test his loyalty and resilience, and he passes with flying colors, impressing even the typically stoic Hodo. The following day at school, Hisa, who also serves as the vice principal, assumes teaching duties. Asano, feeling incredibly tired, struggles to stay awake in class despite its quiet atmosphere. The urge to succumb to a brief nap is overwhelming. Just as he closes his eyes, a chalk whizzes past his head at incredible speed, embedding itself in the wall behind him. This sudden event jolts him wide awake, and he remains alert, employing additional focus. Hisa admonishes him, emphasizing the need to train his mind to resist sleep, warning of more chalk projectiles if he fails to do so. Mitsumi intervenes, attempting to prevent her brother from pushing Asano too hard. However, Asano agrees to undertake the challenge of reducing or eliminating his need for sleep through training. Using a duster, Heiser releases a thick smoke, causing the rest of the class to fall asleep, though Mitsumi is protected by her gas mask. Despite feeling drowsy, Asano's conditioned reflexes allow him to instinctively deflect any incoming chalk projectiles. Making significant progress in his training, Asano is assigned his inaugural mission, to discreetly identify and disarm a couple suspected of carrying guns at an amusement park. Mitsumi surprises Asano by joining him on the mission. Delighted by her presence, he hopes to make the most of the day, aiming to impress her as a capable partner. They discreetly observe three suspicious couples, trailing them as they enjoy various rides and games at the park. Asano notices a couple deeply in love, dressed alike and exchanging romantic gestures. Inspired, he decides to emulate their affection by picking a rose for Mitsumi. After determining the first two couples harmless, they focus on the final pair in suits at a restaurant. While Mitsumi goes to fetch drinks, Asano observes the man retrieving a box from his coat. Alert, Asano prepares for a potential altercation, but the man surprises everyone by proposing with a ring. As relief washes over Asano, a heated argument erupts between the previously affectionate couple. Their dispute escalates, culminating in the girl brandishing a gun at the boy, who retaliates in kind. Panic ensues as people flee, including Mitsumi who becomes trapped. Amidst the chaos, the couple opens fire, endangering everyone. Asano shields a boy under a table, then swiftly disarms the couple with just two shots. Police intervene, apprehending the dangerous duo. Though the day is marred by the incident, Asano's quick actions prevent further harm. To conclude their outing, Asano presents the slightly damaged Rose to Mitsumi as they ride the matchmaker Ferris wheel, hoping the legend holds true and they enjoy lasting happiness as a couple. A few days later, Shin discovers that someone has been trying to hack into their household files for the past four days. She has been tirelessly working to repel the cyber attack without any sleep. Finally, she manages to trap the hacker in a reverse hacking procedure, but the hacker escapes by disconnecting the cord. Shin thinks she has successfully defended the files, but it turns out the hacker has already accessed most of Asano's information. Exhausted, Shin takes a break and informs Asano and Mitsumi about the hacking attempts as they prepare for school. Asano is concerned, suspecting that trouble might be looming, but decides not to dwell on it. As they leave for school, Asano senses danger and pushes Mitsumi behind him just in time to dodge sharp needles that hit the ground. He spots a slender figure hiding behind a pole, and decides to run with Mitsumi through random alleyways. Despite his efforts, the attacker keeps up, forcing Asano to confront her. Ready with his stun gun, Asano watches the alleyway, but the attack comes from above. He manages to block it and push the girl away. The attacker, thrilled by Asano's strength, declares her love for him and her desire to kill him. Matsumi suddenly recognizes the attacker and tells Asano that she is Kiri, a spy known as the Manhunter. Kiri is infamous for carrying needles and stalking the men she becomes infatuated with, ultimately killing them. This comment irritates Kiri, who warns Matsumi never to call her something vulgar like Manhunter again, or she will stab her in the eye. Kiri is clearly smitten with Asano explaining that she first saw him in a video on the dark web and has been infatuated with him ever since. She reveals that Asano is quite famous in the under and pulls out a poster showing a 100,000 bounty on his head. Kiri says this worries her and suddenly throws some needles into the air, causing a man with a gun to fall from above. She explains that many people are after Asano to claim the bounty, but she doesn't care about the money, she only wants to kill him for love. Kiri boasts that she knows everything about him, like how he never walks through a garden during a mission, always tries to repair any damages, and even pays for a ticket before using it on a mission. 
Even Matsumi admits that Kiri's dedication is impressive, while Kiri demands that Asano live with her forever. Asano calmly declines, stating that he is married to Matsumi and will never leave her side. Kiri starts crying, accusing Matsumi of being an ugly thought who must have brainwashed Asano into staying with her. This angers Asano, but he stays quiet as Kiri declares she wants to kill Matsumi and take Asano away. However, Hais has forbidden her from harming even a hair on Matsumi's head. Confused, Matsumi asks if Hais knows about this. Kiri explains that no one can target anyone in the Yazakura family without Hai's knowledge. She got his permission to kill Asano, and he even gave her the security codes to access his files, enabling her to hack the data successfully. Kiri then twirls and showers them with needles, demonstrating her skill by ensuring none hit them. She tells Asano she'll see him soon before jumping over the attacker's body and walking away. Later, in class, the teacher announces a new transfer student, who turns out to be Kiri. She gives a warm greeting, and the boys immediately start admiring her. The teacher asks her to sit beside Asano, which makes him nervous. As she runs to her seat, she intentionally falls and shoots a needle at him. Asano barely deflects it with a notebook. From that moment, his days turn into a game of dodging Kiri's needles and staying alive. Kiri booby traps his seat with poisonous needles and hides needles in her pencil. Despite the constant danger, Asano adapts, even dodging needles while eating lunch with Matsumi without looking. Eventually, the relentless cat and mouse game begins to wear on both of them, leaving them exhausted. Kiri cries at her desk as Asano blocks another one of her attacks. Frustrated, she throws a barrage of needles into the air, hitting all their classmates and knocking them out. She then reveals that she can control anyone struck by her needles and commands the entire class to subdue Asano. Not wanting to hurt innocent people, he ends up getting captured as Kiri prepares to finish him off. Just in time, Matsumi intervenes and tells Kiri to stop. Before they can talk, the window bursts open and the assailant Kiri previously knocked out jumps in with a hand, firing a shot at Kiri. Matsumi pushes her out of the way but gets grazed by the bullet. Enraged, Asano pushes everyone off him and quickly takes down the attacker with a stunning bullet before rushing to check on Matsumi. Kiri is confused about why Matsumi saved her, but Matsumi explains that she's glad someone else sees how great Asano is, which makes her really happy. Kiri then becomes inseparable from Matsumi, making it her new goal to kill Asano so she can have Matsumi all to herself. This bothers Asano, but Matsumi tells him to think of Kiri as a little sister and nothing more. A few days later, Shin calls Asano to her room, saying she wants to play some games with him as part of his training. Matsumi warns him that Shin takes her games very seriously. The last time Shinzo played with her, he had to stay up for three nights straight before finally passing out. Asano starts playing the game with Shin who takes the lead and starts destroying the enemy. Asano quickly gets the hang of it. Soon, they face the final boss, a steam engine that needs to be stopped. They mash the keys furiously and manage to clear the level, stopping the engine. Suddenly, a news report announces that a hijacked train carrying hundreds of innocent lives had miraculously stopped, and the hijackers were found unconscious. Asano realizes that Shin turns real-life missions into games where there are no extra lives and no retry. Feeling the pressure, they move on to the next mission, which is even more dangerous. A group of terrorists has taken a helicopter and plans to crash it into a nuclear power plant, causing a disaster similar to Chernobyl. Shin urges Asano to do his best as she expertly maneuvers through complex landscapes and attacks enemies. Meanwhile, Asano struggles to navigate the obstacles, getting stuck and even glitching through walls. Ignoring his difficulties, Shin continues toward the final boss. She jumps into the air and delivers a killing blow, eliminating it. Surprisingly, the match isn't over. The terrorists had a backup plan and unleash hundreds of drones to destroy the power plant. Even Shin thinks this might be too much for them. But Asano, using his resourcefulness, revives the boss with a potion and uses it to take down the hordes of enemies. Kiri joins in from her own computer, and together they destroy all the drones, winning the game and stopping the terrorist attack. Shin, however, is not pleased that Asano was taking advantage of glitches. So, she forces him to play with her for two nights straight, after which he gets knocked out as well. A few days later, while Asano is doing his intense gigachad training with 500 kgs on his back, he gets a call from Nano, who needs help. Nano explains that he's on a top-secret undercover mission in an evil lab where scientists, are creating bioweapons. They've developed a pill that can instantly kill everyone within a 10 kilometers radius if it explodes. Despite the seriousness of the situation, Nano talks about it casually. He tells Asano that he used his chemicals to put the entire lab to sleep but doesn't think it's safe to bring the potent bioweapon outside. Instead, he decides to gulp it down, trusting his body's natural defenses to neutralize it. The downside is that he immediately starts feeling very sleepy 
and acts like a drunkard. Nano asks Asano to come and fetch him from the secret lab, as he can't let the scientists and security find him while he's in such a vulnerable state. Asano immediately asks for Nano's location, but Nano gives him a vague answer before falling asleep. Worried, Asano quickly dresses and heads for the lab. He manages to reach the general area of the lab but finds it suspiciously easy to navigate. He encounters no one until he turns a corner and sees a bunch of unconscious guards on the floor. As he moves through the area with his gun ready, he wonders if this is Nanao's doing, but it doesn't seem like Nanao's style. Suddenly, he hears a guard approaching. Before Asano can react, a weighted chain strikes the guard, knocking him out. Two young men step out of the shadows and greet Asano. They introduce themselves as Sui, with green hair, and Oga, with yellow hair, claiming they work for a government intelligence unit. Asano recalls hearing about these top-class government spies. Sui explains that they were sent to neutralize the lab and asks Oga if he senses any enemy. Oga, with his superb hearing, quickly detects the enemy's presence. Sui wishes Asano luck with his mission and starts to walk away, but Oga grabs Asano, suggesting they could use some allies. Though unsure about this makeshift alliance, Asano knows they aren't enemies. Together, they easily dispatch the guards and make their way to the inner lab. There, Asano finds Nano lying on the ground. He checks on him and finds he's still alive but in bad condition. Suddenly, a chain flies toward Nano. Asano deflects it with his knife, which breaks on impact and injures his arm. Asano asks what's going on. Sui explains that they were sent to neutralize the lab and overheard Asano's conversation with Nano, learning that Nano ingested the bioweapon. This makes Nano a potential threat that needs to be dealt with. Asano steps in front of Nano, declaring that they'll have to get through him first. He pulls out his stun gun, but Oga warns him not to proceed. However, Sui is not as forgiving. Using a special thunder technique taught by Zenitsu, Sui moves with incredible speed, slicing through Asano's gun and injuring him severely. Asano collapses, bleeding heavily. Oga is furious with Sui, but Sui calmly instructs him to control his emotions and moves towards Nano with the intent to kill. With whatever strength he has left, Asano pleads with Sui to spare Nano. Unmoved, Sui draws his sword. Suddenly, Nano wakes up, announcing that he has neutralized the toxins and offers a test patch as proof. He asks Sui to let him patch up Asano if he still intends to kill him. Sui, now calm, checks the test patch and confirms the toxin is neutralized. He declares their job done, leaves an ointment for Asano, and exits with the test patch as proof. Nano immediately tends to Asano, urging him to stay conscious, but Asano's injuries are too severe and he loses consciousness. A few days later, Asano awakens, alive but punished by Hayes. He is strung above candles due to an article claiming the Yasukura family was defeated by government spies, which infuriates Hayes, especially since it led to negative reviews on Google. Just as Hayes prepares to punish Asano for, Matsumi and Nanao intervene, removing the gag from Asano and telling him not to worry. Asano feels he deserves the punishment for letting the family down. Hayes, swinging Asano around, tells him he can redeem himself by defeating the government spies and avenging his loss. Hayes explains that the spies have special skills, making them the best. He emphasizes that a battle of spies is about intelligence, urging Asano to steal intel from them to prove his worth. The next day, Asano starts tailing Sui, who promptly shreds a delinquent's clothes with his sword. Sui then approaches Asano and asks what he wants. Surprised that his cover was blown so easily, Asano admits that he's there to learn from Sui. Sui, indifferent, tells Asano he can do whatever he wants and then speeds off, forcing Asano to chase him. Asano tries to keep up by jumping through the crowd, but Sui uses his sword to strip him, leading to Asano's arrest for public exposure. Undeterred, Asano follows him again the next day on a train, only for Sui to repeat the trick, forcing Asano away once more. On the third day, Asano hangs atop a building while Sui and Oga have lunch. After they finish, Sui strips him again before they walk away. On the fourth day, Asano manages to tail them until evening when they engage in a fight with some ruffians. Asano helps out by dispatching a few, impressing Oga. However, Sui tries to strip him again. This time, Asano dodges just enough to keep his pants on. Oga laughs, which annoys Sui, who then strips both of them of their dignity. That evening, Nano finds Hai's in the kitchen, chopping vegetables. Nano asks if he has seen Asano. Hai's replies that he found Asano at the front door, as usual, without any clothes. Nano asks if Hai's put Asano back to bed, but Hai's jokes that he thought Asano would make a better chopping board. Nano pushes Hai's away and places Asano back on the table. 
Asano apologizes for his weakness, but Nana reassures him, saying he admires Asano's unique approach to things. This insight prompts Asano to tail Sui again the next day, successfully following him for a full day. Impressed, Sui acknowledges Asano as the first person to tail him for an entire day. In recognition of this accomplishment, Sui declares that he will treat Asano as an equal and engage him in combat. As Sui attacks, Asano seizes his hand and throws him into the air, having noticed Sui's predictable tendency to strike at the center of the body first. Though Asano sustains some injury, Oga emerges from hiding to treat him at Sui's instruction. With this encounter, Asano overcomes the obstacle represented by Sui. Although others forget about his defeat, a spy newspaper reports on his naked sighting, labeling him a pervert, a new challenge for Asano to navigate. Despite this, Matsumi reassures Asano of her love, regardless of the gossip. Days later, Matsumi asks Asano for help with an errand, to which he readily agrees. As they stroll through the bustling park, Asano wonders about the hefty load he's carrying, feeling like a pack mule. Matsumi reassures him and leads the way towards a bench where the familiar green-haired Sui awaits. Sui greets them curtly, while Matsumi engages in casual conversation with him. Asano, still confused, asks what's going on. Matsumi explains they have some business with Sui, leaving Asano puzzled. He questions if Matsumi knows Sui, to which she responds with a smile, assuring him that Sui is just a friend. Asano's mind wanders to past experience, but Matsumi brushes off his concerns, citing the nature of their spy work. They continue walking, with Sui and Matsumi chatting animatedly while Asano trails behind, feeling like a subordinate. They enter a cafe-like establishment, which surprises Asano, expecting a more serious outing. Inside, the cafe resembles a pricey Starbucks, reminiscent of a lavish setting. Sui proceeds to order a coffee with a complex name, leaving Asano bewildered. Matsumi, on the other hand, seems impressed by Sui's coffee expertise. As the barista operates a mysterious device, a trapdoor suddenly appears beneath them, sending them all tumbling through. As Asano plummets alone with the bulky luggage, Sui gallantly carries Matsumi, engaging in conversation with her. Sui introduces them to the government spy headquarters, prompting Asano to caution him to keep his hands off Matsumi. Matsumi reassures Asano that Sui is just a friend, leading Asano to question her loyalty. Sui miraculously produces a cup of tea as they converse, advising Asano to remain vigilant as the situation could escalate. Suddenly, a barrage of projectiles, including arrows, darts, spikes, and lasers, flies toward them, part of the facility's security measures and training protocol. With grace, Sui deflects the projectiles with his sword, while Asano attempts to evade them with leaps and dodges. Sui and Matsumi land safely, while Asano tumbles to the ground. Sui warns Asano to move aside as a massive metal ball nearly crushes him, but a woman intervenes, obliterating the ball with a powerful punch. As Asano watches in awe, the woman questions his ability to protect Matsumi. They gather for a tea party, discovering the luggage is filled with sweets. While the woman indulges in cake, Sui savors small bites. Asano, still perplexed by the situation, observes them, struggling to comprehend what's happening. Matsumi clarifies that the woman is Rin, Hai's classmate, with whom he always clashed. Despite their differences, they both care deeply for Matsumi, who Rin affectionately embraces before turning to Asano. She expresses her desire for Matsumi to marry a strong man who can protect her unconditionally. Rin mentions Sui's description of their encounter, stating that he called Asano a turd face, but Sui corrects that he actually called Asano a dirt bat, criticizing his weakness for a spy. Matsumi defends Asano, asserting that even if he lacks experience, his determination and spirit are as strong as highs. Before they can continue, the walls begin to shake and collapse, revealing highs in his suit, furious that they took Matsumi without his consent. Rin bravely steps forward, inviting highs to join their tea party later. But highs, filled with anger, tries to attack her with his wires. Luckily, Rin's strength allows her to easily destroy his wires with just one punch. Yet, they are both determined to fight. The battle begins, with Rin and highs moving so fast that Asano struggles to keep up. They attack, block, and counterattack with lightning speed, making it hard for Asano to follow their movement. Suddenly, the entire facility starts to break down, and a red alert signals for everyone to evacuate immediately. Matsumi explains to Asano that this kind of situation happens frequently, leaving him surprised. Sui advises them to stay back as he attempts to intervene. With remarkable speed, Sui draws his sword and jumps into the fray. However, he quickly realizes that he's no match for Rin and Hai's who effortlessly fend off his attacks and continue their fierce battle. Suddenly, Matsumi steps forward and positions herself between Hai's and Rin, halting their impending attacks. However, it's too late for them to stop, realizing that their strikes might hit Matsumi. 
Just in time, Asano intervenes, pushing Matsumi's head down and taking the blows meant for her, causing him to fall into Matsumi's arms. Amidst the silence, Matsumi calmly addresses both Hais and Rin, warning them that if they don't cease their fight immediately, she will cut off communication with them. This stern statement instantly quells their aggression. However, Hais is so frightened that he faints, while Rin, overwhelmed with remorse, collapses to the ground and apologizes to Matsumi. Turning to Asano, Rin praises him for sacrificing himself to protect Matsumi, while Matsumi smiles, acknowledging his inner strength despite his unassuming appearance. After regaining consciousness, Rin approaches Asano and assigns him a task. She requests his assistance in conducting an undercover investigation against one of the most influential politicians in their area. While Matsumi secures highs, Rin elaborates on the target of their investigation, a politician named Cairo. She reveals that Cairo holds significant influence among the public and is poised to win the upcoming election. Initially, his eccentric appearance and lively campaign rallies masked his true nature. However, it's become apparent that he is nefarious, utilizing a trio of highly skilled spies known as Red, Blue, and Yellow to carry out his sinister deeds. These operatives serve as his enforcers, engaging in activities like extortion, bribery, and even murder to eliminate political adversaries. Despite efforts by government spies to gather intelligence on Cairo, their findings have been limited. They've only managed to uncover a small explosive device, likely procured from abroad with the intent of eliminating opposing leaders. When they attempted to interrogate the seller of the bomb, he provided them with a video recording showcasing the anonymous buyer, further complicating their investigation. Asano is shocked as he watches the video, clearly showing the politician's involvement. However, Rin explains that it's not sufficient evidence to arrest him. Puzzled, Asano asks why he's been chosen for this task. Rin reveals that they've been monitoring the politician for some time, but he's become wary of government spies. They need someone unexpected, an outsider, recently affiliated with one of the independent spy groups. She explains they must alter his appearance, and Sui swiftly cuts Asano's hair while Matsumi dyes it black and dresses him in a secretary's outfit. Seeing his transformed appearance, Asano feels uneasy about impersonating a woman to deceive others. Rin reveals that the politician has advertised for a secretary matching Asano's new appearance, making him a perfect candidate for infiltration. The plan succeeds, and at the next public event, the politician proudly introduces Asano as his new secretary. Amidst the festive atmosphere, loud music blares, but the mood shifts abruptly when protesters storm the stage, decrying the politician as a tyrant who threatens to become a dictator if not stopped. After that, everything turned chaotic as fights broke out and things got messy. In the commotion, a large speaker toppled over, nearly hitting one of the protesters. Surprisingly, Kuro rushed forward, taking the hit to protect the protester. He expressed that public feedback was crucial for his improvement and his party's progress, deeply touching the protester, who shook hands with him amid the cheers of the crowd. An ambulance was called, and Kuro, with a bloody face, was placed on a stretcher. He instructed Asano to return to the office while he joined the spies in the ambulance. Once out of sight, he removed his bandages, revealing his unharmed face, and celebrated his successful media stunt, which was rapidly spreading on the internet. He commended Red for strategically placing the speaker to fall and asked Blue about public opinion, learning that his staged heroic act had increased his popularity even more. Unnoticed by them, Asano had sneaked in and was eavesdropping on their conversations, determined to uncover their illegal activities. He meticulously searched through their documents and belongings, but found nothing incriminating. Despite being around them constantly, he couldn't find any evidence of wrongdoing, yet they seamlessly continued their illegal actions during their election campaign. Confused by their flawless coordination without explicit discussions, Asano recalled their rhythmic dances and realized they were communicating through Morse code. He deciphered their plans to plant a bomb at the upcoming conference attended by the Prime Minister. They intended to frame external forces for the attack while Asano was still present. To thwart their scheme, Asano decided to feign injury during the attack and then publicly denounce the terrorists while vowing to protect the country. With this plan in mind, Asano prepared himself for the next day's events, ready to foil their sinister plot. Cairo attempts to detonate the bomb but is surprised when nothing happens. Instead, the bomb is tossed into a fountain by Asano in a moment of panic. In response, Cairo draws his gun and shoots Asano claiming to possess another bomb. He triggers the second bomb, aiming to eliminate the witnesses, but it turns out to be harmless cotton candy, leaving him bewildered. As Asano rises to his feet, realizing Cairo's gun contains only paintballs, he and his allies arm themselves with guns. However, Sui intervenes and disarms them with his swift swordplay, causing the spies to flee in fear. Alone and unarmed, Cairo attempts to retrieve another gun, 
but Sui swiftly disarms him again and entrusts him to Asano's custody for transport. During the journey, Hiro reveals that he is privy to intimate details of Asano's life and suggests that his family's death was not accidental but orchestrated by unknown assailants. Asano is stunned by this revelation and demands further explanation at gunpoint, unaware that Kiro is amused by his reaction, having successfully manipulated him. The deputy prime minister has been abducted, and his condition is being live-streamed from an unknown location. The deputy prime minister at the recent meeting turned out to be a decoy, and Sui believes that Kairo orchestrated the entire plan. He tasks Asano with interrogating the captured politician to extract the deputy prime minister's location. Cairo, overhearing this, remarks that the timing is convenient since he had also planned to visit the kidnapping site. Suddenly, his restraints fall off, leaving Asano stunned as Cairo drops his earring. The earring reveals itself to be a bomb, which detonates and destroys the entire van. Meanwhile, at the Yazakura mansion, Nano is experimenting with a new chemical, but a mishap results in a massive explosion. Mutsumi rushes into his room wearing a gas mask and asks if he is alright. Nano apologizes for damaging the room, but Mutsumi points out that he is in worse shape, with his muscles grotesquely swollen and out of proportion. Nano resumes his work, explaining to Mutsumi that he is worried about Asano potentially coming home severely injured. This is why he is trying to create a highly effective healing potion. When he asks Mutsumi if she is concerned about Asano, she admits that she is very worried as well. To prepare for Asano's return, she has cooked a grand feast, believing that even if he comes back injured, eating the food will help him recover instantly. Nano, however, seems skeptical. Mutsumi then wonders what the rest of the family members are doing. Nano tells her that Kengo is creating a machine washable face mask for Asano in case he comes back home unrecognizable. Shin is busy disabling the computers of their critics to prevent them from causing a commotion if anything happens to Asano. Shinzo is extremely worried about Asano too which is why he cannot bring himself to leave the garbage can. Hais and Fuda, on the other hand, are calmly having tea. Fuda believes there is no need to worry because Asano can handle things when necessary. Hais has the opposite attitude, wishing for Asano to meet a horrible end. Hearing all this does not ease Mutsumi's anxiety about her husband. Back at the location of the explosion, Asano is helping the injured driver, pulling him away from the flames. He receives a call from Sui, who asks if he is okay. Asano assures him that he is not injured and even managed to save the driver, but Cairo escaped. Sui replies that it is not a problem because they were expecting it. He reveals that they had been hiding the truth about Cairo's identity from him. Cairo is not just an ordinary politician, but a former legendary spy thought to have died six years ago before starting a second career as a politician. They deliberately had loose security around him this time to figure out his plans. They placed a GPS tracker on Cairo and Sui tells Asano to return home because his mission is now complete. On the other hand, Kiro removes the blindfold of the deputy prime minister before taking a seat next to him. This meeting is being live-streamed across the country, throwing the media and general public into chaos. That was Kiro's motive from the beginning. The minister expresses his disappointment in Kiro, whom he thought was a committed politician despite his odd activity. He tells Kuro that engaging in such terrorist activities won't change the political situation in his favor. Kuro starts removing his disguise, and as he takes off his funky glasses, the minister begins trembling upon noticing his pitch black eyes. Kuro remarks that the minister must have been certain he had killed him, which is why he didn't recognize his true identity earlier. The minister finally recognizes Kuro as a spy he had dealt with in the past. Kuro then turns to the audience and tells them that today, he will address them not as a politician, but as a man who lost his child. He reveals that he took revenge on numerous politicians involved in his downfall behind the scenes. However, the deputy prime minister was the biggest culprit, so he wants to deliver justice to him in front of the entire world. Hiro points his gun at him, asking if he will tell the world the truth and end his political career or refuse to answer and die. The minister scoffs, saying it is a foolish idea to ask politicians to speak the truth. Just as Kuro decides to end the minister's life, the stream gets cut off abruptly. Asano arrives just in time and shoots down the recording device. Kuro is pleased to see the young spy but Asano demands he let the minister go. Kuro refuses, knowing that Asano can't shoot him because the minister would also be caught in the crossfire. Kuro fires at Asano's hand, forcing him to drop his gun. However, Asano uses this opportunity to close the distance between them and grabs Kuro from behind. Kuro, anticipating this move, grabs Asano and slams him to the ground. He knows all about the weapons and fighting techniques used by the Yasakura family and takes the steel wires from Asano's pocket, using them to tie him up. 
Asano demands to know how Kuro could be so knowledgeable about his tactics. Kuro replies that his expertise lies in gathering information and leveraging it to his advantage. Asano questions why a spy like Kuro became a politician and deceived the public. Kuro explains that he has no interest in politics and that everything he did was solely for revenge. Intrigued, Asano listens as Kuro recounts his story. Due to his exceptional skills, Kuro was highly valued in the political world and often tasked with politicians' dirty work. However, at home, he was just a loving, albeit foolish, father who adored his daughter. On her birthday, he wore a funky wig and glasses to entertain her, making her laugh at his antics. She remarked that if he wanted to surprise her, he shouldn't have sent the gift in advance. Confused, Kuro saw her pointing at a box in the corner that suddenly exploded, destroying their entire house. Kuro lost his daughter in the explosion and could only cry for her. He realized that his masters had decided to dispose of him now that he had served their purpose. In that moment, he vowed to exact revenge on them and make them feel the same pain he had endured. To accomplish this, he faked his own death and entered the political arena under a new identity. Kuro reveals that once he became a politician, it was easy to use his new position and past achievements to attract his targets, drawing them in close to exact his revenge. Kuro points his gun at the minister, declaring that he is the last one left. Asano suddenly lunges toward Kuro, but three of Kuro's spy guards appear out of nowhere and stop him. Kuro tells Asano that he cannot win against them alone. He adds that since Asano has also lost his family, he does not want to hurt him. Instead, Kuro proposes to tell Asano everything he knows about his family's death if Asano steps back now. Asano is tempted but resolute, stating that he wants to know about his family but not at the cost of someone else's life. Just then, Sui arrives and, before anyone realizes it, he cuts a huge hole in the floor. The three lackeys and Sui fall through the hole, and Sui asks Asano to deal with Kuro and rescue the minister. Asano attacks Kuro, but Kuro easily blocks his poison-laced knife. Knowing about the poison, Kuro stabs Asano with the knife, causing Asano's muscles to go lax, rendering him unable to fight back. Kuro strikes Asano away, and he lies on the floor bleeding. Asano tries to get up again, but Kuro tells him it is useless. Meanwhile, the three spies confront Sui, confident in their abilities. Red specializes in using fire, blue in high-pressure water that can cut through anything, and yellow in electricity that can fry any computer or brain. They boast about being unbeatable together, like Power Rangers. Sui is impressed by their confidence and decides to reveal his trick. He explains that his ability allows him to move very fast and silently, which is highly advantageous in battle. The three spy brothers combine their powers and send a giant elemental ball towards Sui. However, Sui uses a special demon slayer move to slash through it in one go, defeating the three brothers in the same move. He then decides to back up Asana but suddenly senses a presence behind him. Instinctively, he swings his sword at it, only to find nothing there. Despite this, Sui is certain that someone very powerful was there just a moment ago. Back on top, Asano manages to stand up again. Hiro talks to him about how the pain of losing one's family never truly goes away, and tells Asano that he cannot change anything about his life or his current situation. Asano admits that Kuro is right but then remembers a day when he went to pay respect at his parents' grave. Watsumi was praying by Asano's side, giving him strength. With this in mind, Asano charges towards Kuro, who is confident that he knows all of Asano's techniques and weapons. However, just as Asano reaches him, he uses Sui's silent stepping technique and appears behind Kuro before he can even react. Kuro is bewildered by how Asano knows this technique. It turns out that Heise had warned Asano about the dangers of fighting a pro, as they tend to know everything about their opponent. Heise explained that this overconfidence can be used against them since they lose their ability to deal with the unexpected. He advised Asano that even an imperfect or unrefined technique could surprise and work against a seasoned pro. Asano reaches behind Kuro, grabs his arm, and cracks open the antidote to the poison hidden in his teeth. Kuro tries stabbing him with a knife again, but Asano blocks the attack with synthetic skin on his arms. Kuro loses the knife and pulls out his gun, but Asano is already too close to let him take a shot. Asano pushes Kuro's hand back, jamming the gun with slime. Kuro pulls out a second gun but Asano chops it with the steel spider wire and pins Kiro to the ground. Kiro realizes that his excellence in gathering information has led to his downfall. He praises Asano, saying he will become a great spy one day, and advises him to keep moving forward out of respect for his actions and determination. Kiro decides to share all his information with Asano. He grabs Asano's hand and places something in it, but before he can reveal anything about Asano's family, he is shot in the neck. Asano is stunned because he didn't hear a gunshot and there should be no one behind him. With his last breath, 
Kuro tells Asano to keep moving forward and then loses consciousness forever. Sui arrives and realizes that another assassin must have silenced Kuro. He tells Asano to be proud that he completed his mission against a much more experienced spy. Asano can only look at the paper slip that Kuro left him. It turns out that the paper contains a map pointing to where Kuro had buried his daughter. Asano goes to her grave to pay respects as per Kuro's last wish. After that, he puts his hand in a tiny hole in a tree and retrieves a box containing the information he has been searching for. Later, Asano returns home to his eagerly waiting family. Mutsumi runs to hug him, and everyone praises him for doing a great job. Although something seems to be bothering him, Asano can smile when he is with his family. A couple of days later, Rin calls both Asano and Mutsumi to her headquarters. They all sit down, and Rin congratulates Asano on successfully completing his mission, announcing that they are going to celebrate with a hot pot meal. Everyone gathers around the table as Rin puts an enormous amount of rice in Asano's bowl, then claims that she will prepare everything for the hot pot. Asano asks Sui what Rin is talking about. Sui explains that whenever Rin arranges a hot pot, she goes all out by capturing and hunting all the animals with her bare hands before bringing them in to cook. Rin walks towards a huge cluster of monstrous animals, much larger than herself, and contemplates which meat to use first. Sui approaches her and offers to chop the meat to size. Rin allows him, and with a single elegant slash of his sword, Sui perfectly cuts every animal to the right size for the hot pot. The amazing smell of food fills the room as Asano, acting like a total gentleman, grabs a bowl, fills it with soup, meat, and veggies, and hands it to Matsumi. Matsumi is touched and thanks him sincerely as she takes the bowl. But before she can take a bite, Hai stuffs Asano's mouth with a bunch of veggies, causing him to choke and fall to the ground. Hai's warns Asano never to portion out food for his sister again, claiming that honor for himself alone. Hai's quickly gets a bowl of food and tells Matsumi that he only put in her favorite items. However, Rin puts Hai's in his place by pushing his head into the bowl, telling him to back off and stop acting like a jealous in law. This infuriates Hai's, and a food fight immediately breaks out between him and Rin, with both of them throwing food at each other. The others quickly move out of the way to avoid getting caught in the crossfire. Toga, extremely hungry and unable to bear seeing all the food go to waste, tries to get a bowlful before it all spills. However, he ends up with a fish cake hitting his face, knocking him out into Asano's arms. Meanwhile, Sui remains his cool self, dodging the flying veggies with ease and catching the meat pieces midair to eat them. Sui explains to Asano that dodging something not aimed directly at them is easy. He grabs a couple of bowls, uses his special walking technique to fill them with food, and hands one to Matsumi who then gives one to an impressed Asano while keeping the other for herself. Sui warns Asano to be careful with the walking technique as it can be hard on their bones and cause permanent damage. Before Asano can respond, a piece of hot meat slams into his face, making him scream. Sui continues to nonchalantly pick and choose what he wants to eat, grabbing it from the air. Eventually, everyone has eaten their fill. Oga and Rin fall asleep on the floor, while Sui efficiently cleans up the mess. Meanwhile, Hasano sits behind a shelf, contemplating a small cube, wondering if it holds the truth about his family's death, as Kuro claimed. Watsumi surprises him by sitting beside him and asking if the cube contains information about his family. Hasano confirms that it does. She asks why he looks so stressed, and he admits that although he instinctively tried to save the Prime Minister from Kira, there was a split second where he thought that if he found his family's killer, he would dedicate his life to eliminating them. This makes him feel equal to Kuro, leaving him questioning his right to condemn him. He fears uncovering the secret might change him. Without saying anything, Matsumi kisses him on the cheek, surprising him. When he asks why, she smiles and says she just wanted to comfort him. At that moment, the cube opens, and a marble falls out. Asano grabs the marble, puzzled by its purpose. Hyze appears, explaining that the marble is a special device containing optical information. Asano notices Hyze's bloodshot eyes, realizing Hyze must have seen Matsumi kiss him and is now preparing to vaporize him in a jealous rage. Luckily, Rin intervenes, grabbing Hyze from behind and urging Asano to run away quickly. Later that day, Asano and Matsumi return home. Asano feels extremely tired, his body heavy and suddenly realizes someone is sitting on his head. It's Ayaka, the assassin, dressed in a maid outfit. Surprised, Asano asks what she's doing there. Ayaka explains that Matsumi asked her to stay, and Matsumi confirms that Ayaka will be their live-in maid, handling day-to-day -day tasks. Ayaka starts dancing around Asano, claiming she knows everything that has happened and about the optical drive he received. When Asano asks how she knows, Ayaka reveals that she is a spy and knows everything, grabbing the marble from his pocket. Asano tries to take it back, but Shin, with sleepy eyes, enters the room, takes the marble from Ayaka, and examines it. 
Shin notes that the marble is extremely old and slightly damaged, saying it will take considerable time to extract the data. While Matsumi calls Ayaka over to teach her how to make good tea, Asano questions the wisdom of having a spy assassin in their house. Ayaka argues it's perfect timing, explaining that Asano's bounty has significantly increased due to his last mission, making him more prominent in the underworld and likely to face numerous assassination attempts. To prepare him, she will try to assassinate him daily while he practices evading her attacks. She throws a bunch of forks at him, leaving Asano pondering the kind of life he is now destined to live. Later that evening, Asano is utterly exhausted from training. He lies down on the table, unable to move, while Matsumi offers to make him some tea. He thanks her but says he wants to take a bath first. He heads to the bathroom for a refreshing shower, only to be startled by Ayaka emerging from the bathroom. She begins clicking pictures of him, stating that it's essential for a spy to be vigilant, especially when they're vulnerable. Ayaka continues snapping pictures and then grabs a bottle, squirting an acidic solution that burns the walls. Asano dodges frantically, trying to escape. Suddenly, the house's defense system activates, shocking Ayaka in the bathtub. Ayaka, now trapped, warns Asano not to come near, as he would get shocked too. Desperate to save her, Asano breaks through the wall and finds the main power outlet. Without hesitation, he jumps into the tub, grabs Ayaka, and with his other arm, holds onto the power supply. Ayaka pleads with him to let her go, but Asano perseveres, managing to short the power supply and causing an explosion. Afterward, he stands over Ayaka on the ground. Unfortunately, Heiz walks in at that moment, finding Asano in a compromising position. Infuriated, Heiz grabs a prehistoric torture device, declaring that no man should even look at another woman if he's married to Matsumi. Asano runs for his life as Heiz and the smitten Ayaka chase him, both naked, through the house. A few days later, Asano resumes his regular missions. One day, he forgets his phone. When Matsumi tries to hand it over to him, she notices a call from someone named Kaori. Asano quickly snatches it from her, claiming it's no one important before cutting the call and leaving. Matsumi is left puzzled. Ayaka appears behind her, startling her. Ayaka dramatically claims these are signs of cheating, leaving early, coming back late, turning off his location, getting calls from unknown people, and evading her attempts to follow him. Ayaka insists these are clear signs of cheating, but Matsumi trusts Asano and tells Ayaka not to worry. The next day, Matsumi takes Goliath out for a walk with Asano. She expresses her happiness at spending quality time with him, given his recent busyness. Asano smiles and starts asking questions about Goliath's breed. Matsumi explains that Goliath isn't an ordinary dog. He has been with the Yazakira family for hundreds of years, even serving as a guard dog for her great-great-grandmother. She reveals that Goliath is a special mix between a mystic wolf and a dog, allowing him to change shape. Right then, in front of Asano's eyes, Goliath transforms, becoming more wolf-like and growing in size. Matsumi mounts Goliath, demonstrating his strength, and asks Asano if he would like to join her. Goliath, however, has other plans and flicks Asano away with his tail, forcing Matsumi to hand over only the leash. Immediately, Goliath takes off, running at an incredible speed and dragging Asano behind him, even splashing through water. By the time they are done, Asano is drenched and lying on the ground in a park. Suddenly, a couple of kids gather around Goliath to admire him. Matsumi goes over, but Goliath senses danger. An explosion occurs, and thankfully, Matsumi saves the kids while Goliath shields her. They soon realize that Asano tried to protect them and took the brunt of the damage. This angers Matsumi, who asks Goliath to find the culprit. Goliath immediately sniffs the detonator and traces a route through the city. They discover that a third-rate imitator, planning to kill Matsumi, orchestrated the explosion from his mom's basement. The man is stunned to see Matsumi still alive. Goliath bursts through his door and swiftly eliminates him. Later that evening, Asano receives a call, which he quickly hides, claiming he needs to return home. Matsumi doesn't question him and asks Goliath to take them back. To their surprise, this time Goliath allows Asano to sit on his back, and they return home swiftly. Upon arriving, Asano is immediately attacked by Ayaka, who accuses him of cheating. Hearing this, even Heiz arrives, ready to torture him. Before they can do anything, two people enter the room, identifying themselves as government spies. They clarify the misunderstanding, explaining that Kaoru is actually an old man. One of the spies produces special dark sweet tea leaves, which Asano had been trying to obtain. It turns out Asano wanted to get Hai's favorite tea leaves, which are extremely rare. He had gone through numerous missions to retrieve the ingredients but kept it a secret. Hai's is overwhelmed with shame, realizing that someone he had antagonized so much did something so kind for him. Later that evening, they all sit down to enjoy the tea together, discussing future plans for the Yazakura family. 
This bring an end to our episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe our channel for more anime recaps. A few days later, Futa trains Asano's reflexes by shooting baseballs at him using a Gatling gun. Asano can barely keep up while dodging them, and after the grueling session, he returns home. There, he finds Matsumi looking at an old picture book. Everyone in the picture looks quite young, and Matsumi proudly shows it to Futa and Asano. He asks about the occasion for the picture, and Matsumi explains it was taken to celebrate Neno passing his spy license exam. Futa confirms that it is a family tradition to take a photo when someone gets their license. Asano, curious about the spy license, looks puzzled, and the girls watch him with confusion. Futa then explains that a spy license is like a membership card issued by the Spy Association, which was formed at the beginning of the 20th century by spies to foster mutual aid. The association conducts exams each year, and those who pass receive a spy license. Futa shows her golden license, the highest rank, and explains that licensed spies can get intel and job references from the association, along with other benefits. Everyone starts at bronze rank, and by passing advancement exams, they can raise their level. As the levels increase, so do the difficulty of missions and benefits. Asano expresses a desire to take the license examination, and Futa encourages him. Just then, Heiz arrives, having overheard the conversation. He reminds Asano that every family member has passed on the first try and warns him that if he doesn't, things will be bad. Heiz starts chasing Asano around the room. Suddenly, they hear Ayaka scream and find her cry and apologizing to Shin in her room. Everyone asks what happened, and Shin explains that Ayaka accidentally caused a glitch in her program by touching the cable. Suddenly, a horror scene from a movie plays on the giant screen, causing Asano to freak out. Matsumi and Shin realize Futa is frozen with fear. Her siblings sigh as they take her out, bundled up in a blanket and shivering. Matsumi explains that Futa is terrified of ghosts because her powers don't work on them. Shin recounts how Futa once destroyed a haunted house in the past. Matsumi comforts her, saying she will be fine after resting, but Futa remains scared of every sound, climbing on Matsumi's head when the wind rattles the windows. Shin mentions supposed paranormal activities in the house, which freaks out Futa even more until Matsumi stops her from pulling Shin's hair out. Futa becomes very clingy, needing to be surrounded by her siblings and even asking Shin to accompany her to the washroom. When a horror program comes on TV, Shinzo shoots the remote to change the channel. Kengo tries to play pranks on her, but everyone reprimands him. After a day of caring for Futa, Matsumi takes her to bed and asks Asano to stand guard so they can sleep peacefully. Futa is still shivering, so Matsumi decides to read her favorite bedtime story, a modern adaptation of a famous Japanese folktale. As Matsumi reads about an old lady finding a baby boy in a river during a brutal war, she falls asleep, and Asano takes over. He reads about the boy growing up to become humanity's hope and eventually killing his demon best friend in the final battle. Asano finds the story cringeworthy, but Futa claps, having returned to normal. Futa apologizes to Asano for showing her vulnerable side. She explains how her mother used to read this story to her and how she feared losing what she held dear after her mother died. Futa admits feeling like a failure as the eldest daughter because she needs to be cared for instead of protecting her sibling. Asano empathizes, sharing his fear of losing loved ones motivates him to become stronger. Futa chuckles and asks him to go to his room, thanking him again and wishing him luck for his license examination. Asano leaves, and Futa gently caresses Matsumi, covering her with a blanket. On the day of the spy license examination, the first task is to run with heavy weights tied to their feet. Matsumi watches from the waiting area, cheering on Asano, who surpasses everyone and finishes first. While most are impressed, some are displeased. Later, Asano eats rice balls made by Matsumi, who tells him to rest before his next test. The Mohawk guy he defeated earlier plans to attack Asano but is stopped by another participant, Hoshi, who uses a fan to blow him away. Asano thanks Hoshi, who reveals he was just protecting what he loves. Hoshi behaves creepily, taking close-up pictures of Asano and showing off a tiny doll he made from Asano's mission clothes and hair. Asano is freaked out, but the next test, freeing themselves from chains underwater, begins. Asano completes it easily, with Hoshi nearby, still making comments. The next test involves hide and seek with execution, and Hoshi continues to pester Asano. The final test is defusing a bomb, which Asano clears with time to spare, followed by a written exam with eliminations for wrong answers. Asano struggles with the exam until Hoshi shows him his answer sheet. After the last test, the contestants are told to collect their licenses but face one final challenge as the hallway crumples. Asano and Hoshi dodge traps, but Mohawk hits Asano, knocking him down. Hoshi helps Asano, using his fan to lift them both to safety, 
and reveals he is a silver-ranked spy and the proctor for the exam. He explains that the tests were designed to check skills and judge character, declaring Asano has a character worthy of respect, thus passing the test. Asano is delighted to receive his license, but Hoshi's crush joke continues, prompting Asano to jump into the pool below. Later, a party celebrates Asano's success. Hais falls from the roof, revealing secret passageways he created to spy on Matsumi, which Futa realizes were also used to freak her out. Futa breaks Hais's bones in response. They add Asano's license photo to the family album. A couple of days later, Asano discovers an old man in his school bag, who explains that the face ID to the house resets if one is away for a year. Asano didn't want to deal with the traps, so he simply jumped into the school bag to be carried safely. Asano could only stare at the old man, dumbfounded. The old man remarked that Asano looked quite stiff for his new grandchild. Asano's brain finally started working, and he immediately pulled out his gun, registering the old man as an intruder. Despite the old man's protests, Asano shot him. It was only after Matsumi arrived to clear up the confusion that Asano believed Ban was really the grandfather of the Yasukura family. Ayaka came by to give the old man some towels, and he instantly began flirting with her. He then pulled Asano and Matsumi closer, telling her that she had found a nice husband with good reflexes. Ban even gave them a wedding gift, a thick bundle of money. Matsumi asked if he had come all this way only for that, and Ban affirmed but claimed there was something else too. Suddenly, Ban started pulling Asano away with him, saying it was time for some valuable life lessons from Grandpa. However, he found himself tied by Hai's spider threats. Hai's asked the old man what he was doing there, and Ban asked if Hai's was not abroad on a mission. Hai's replied that he had an emergency mission from the police to bring back the escaped convict from the Yasukura family. Asano was aghast by this information, but Ban claimed that Hai's words were misleading. Ban explained that he was permanently stationed inside the prison to act as a spy and gather information from the underworld criminals. Ban said he would return soon, so he just wanted to let loose for a couple of hours before that. Hais denied the request, knowing Ban was a womanizer who spilled all secrets when drunk in the company of pretty women. Hais told him that his vacation was over, and Ban simply asked him not to get cocky because he was still his grandpa. Ban casually slipped through the spider threads and activated a smoke bomb using his watch. When the smoke cleared, Ban had vanished, taking Asano along with him. Hais received a call from the police officer in charge of Ban, informing him that he had sent Asano to track the old man. Meanwhile, Goliath came to Matsumi, holding a picture of a man and a woman in his mouth, which reminded her of something. Later, Hais called Asano and told him about Ban's superpower, which allowed him to manipulate his bones for extreme flexibility. Ban had gathered too much information over the decades, and almost everyone in the spy world was out to get him. Hais asked Asano to apprehend Ban, even if he had to rough him up a bit. Luckily, Asano was with Ban in an exclusive bar where the old man was boasting about his wealth and information. Ban spilled some top-secret information to the girls, and Asano tried to shut his mouth, but Ban easily slipped from his grip. He told Asano that he was too young to stop him. However, Ban found himself stuck in place with a special sticky slime prepared by Nana. But Ban easily slipped out of his clothes and posed in front of the girls, challenging Asano and telling him he would train him. Asano charged at him, but Ban dodged all his attempts to subdue him without breaking a sweat. After Asano tired out, Ban patted his back and predicted that he would be able to graze him in about five years. Asano asked why Ban had to break out of prison to see them, as he could have waited until his mission was over. Ban replied that he had to do it today, claiming a youngster like Asano wouldn't understand his reasons. Just then, the bartender arrived with Ban's favorite drink. Ban offered some to Asano, but he refused, saying he was not of age yet. Ban called him a beta male and asked how he was going to give him a great-grandchild like this. Asano freaked out, and Ban teased him with graphic stories of him and his wife Keiko making out. Ban recited how his life was worthless and full of solitude before he met Keiko. He said it was a rainy day, and he was injured from a mission when Keiko found him, changing his life for good. Ban said his wife was too good for him and he felt Asano was like him. That was why he wanted to talk to him as his senior who married into the Yasukura family. Ban told him to cherish the present so that he had no regrets. Asano poured Ban a drink, telling him to rest assured. He claimed Matsumi had made him the happiest man in the world, and he planned to cherish and protect her always. Ban gulped down the drink, told Asano he liked him, and began getting closer to him. He was unaware that an old lady was calmly walking towards him until she put special handcuffs around his arms and hers. She knew he would be there and told him that if he took his hand out of the handcuffs by force or trickery, they would explode. She asked him to behave well if he didn't want to blow off his wife's hands. Matsumi arrived and apologized to Asano for being late, 
introducing the old woman as Grandma Keiko. Asano was shocked because he thought Keiko was dead based on Ban's story, but she was very much alive. Ban clung to his wife, telling her he had ordered her favorite drink and had asked the girls earlier about presents for her since it was their anniversary. Keiko refused to indulge him and quietly sent him back to prison despite his crying and protesting. Asano finally understood why the old man broke out of prison today, and Matsumi said she only remembered after seeing the picture of their youth. Asano remarked that he understood Grandpa's feelings as well, and Matsumi suddenly blushed. She had been hiding early and heard Asano talking about how she made him the happiest man. With those feelings in her heart, she grabbed his hand. The next day, Matsumi showed Asano some pictures of Keiko and Ban, who managed to convince his wife to go on a date with him before returning to prison. Asano said that one thing everyone could learn from Ban was to be romantic even at an old age. A couple of days later, Ban broke out of prison again to see his family but only found the maid Ayaka there because everyone else had gone on their monthly family shopping trip. They had lunch at a fancy restaurant, and everyone had plans for the rest of the afternoon. Pais tried to leave first, but Fuda grabbed his hand and asked him to pay the bill as the eldest son. He said he would only pay for Matsumi's bill, but she gave him a cute and innocent look, and he immediately paid for everyone's food. With that, everyone went their separate ways, and Asano recalled the time he used to come to the mall with his family. Matsumi called for his attention, and he asked her what they were going to buy. She told him some routine grocery items but ended the list with ammo and grenades. She wasn't joking and bought some grenades from a hidden device in the mall. Next, they went to a Starbucks in the mall, and Matsumi ordered 100 kilos of iron tapioca coffee. Asano was confused, but the barista understood her order and delivered 100 kilos of rifle ammo to them. Asano finally understood that this place was where spies, assassins, and all members of the underworld could buy their supplies. Meanwhile, Shin and Shinzo were at the shop of a feeble old man who sold them a chip to process information from the old memory ball. Shinzo was confused about which gun to buy, but Shin knew his habits and told him to pick the one in the left hand. Fuda was getting a hardcore massage from a muscle granny who told her to take better care of her body because she could tell Fuda had been overworking. Nana was buying high concentration cyanide pills, and Kengo was buying face packs to ensure his skin remained smooth even after wearing lots of disguises. Hais entered a mysterious bookshop and bought a rare horror book with mischievous intentions. Asano also went to a specialized laundromat where they made ordinary clothes bulletproof and removed blood stain. Suddenly, a crying girl grabbed his arm, calling for her dad. Asano took the girl to Matsumi and explained that she had lost her parents in the mall. Matsumi tried to comfort the girl, named Suzu, and learned that some scary people had taken her dad downstairs. Matsumi got alert and pressed a secret code on the elevator, taking them to the basement, where they sold things too dark and edgy for the main mall. As they reached the basement, Asano was shocked because it looked like a scene from a dystopia. They kept walking until the girl recognized her dad's voice crying for help. His former boss was trying to force him to do their dirty work again, and when the man refused, the boss tried to gouge his eyes out. Asano stunned the boss by shooting him, and Suzu was reunited with her dad. Matsumi said they should get out now, but then they found themselves surrounded by trouble. No one wanted to mess with the head of the Yasakura family, but they were aware of the bounty on Asano's head and immediately pounced on him to capture him. He panicked as he was jumped by the lowlifes, but Hais came to the rescue and dealt with the attackers in one go. Asano was relieved to see him, but then he noticed the book in Hai's hands, a collection of torture methods, and realized Hai's plan to try them out on him. The lowlifes hesitated to attack, but the baldy thought the numbers were still on their side. On the day Teo and his family were driving down the highway, Teo was enthusiastically demonstrating his video game skills to his younger brother. Meanwhile, his mother was complaining that he invested far more effort into his video games than he did into his schoolwork. However, his father wasn't much better. He was so focused on his job that he hardly spent any time with the family. Recently, his father had taken some time off work, so they planned a camping trip. Unfortunately, it started raining just as they arrived, threatening to ruin their plans. His father apologized to everyone, but Teo reassured him that it was okay and continued playing his game. At that moment, the car spun out of control, resulting in a tragic accident that killed his entire family. Startled awake from his nightmare, Teo lay in bed for a few minutes, reflecting on the events. Later that day, he went to Shin's room so she could analyze the optical storage device they had acquired from Kiroko. From what she could discern, it contained the guest list from their parents' wedding reception. Most of the attendees were civilians, suggesting that the wedding was open to the general public. Normally, there wouldn't be anything unusual about this, but Teo's parents were also on the list. 
Although they couldn't draw any definitive conclusions from just a guest list, one thing was clear. There had to be some kind of connection between the Azakuras and the Asanos before they were born. Teo seems oddly calm about the revelation, but ever since Kiragao told him that someone was behind his family's death, he has mentally prepared himself for anything. At the moment, he's more concerned about Matsumi, who nearly died of shock. She starts crying and tells Teo that she thinks they should get divorced because she feels unworthy of being married to him. Matsumi is convinced that his parents died because they got involved with her family, leading her to feel immense guilt. However, Teo grabs her hand and tells her that they don't know if the Yazakura family caused the accident. He reassures her that, regardless of what they discover, as long as she wasn't directly involved, he will never stop loving her, so she should stop talking about breaking up. Despite his reassurances, Teo still wants to uncover the truth about what happened to his parents, so he asks Shin for help. Shin says she already planned on helping him from the start since he is her little brother now, but she admits she's unsure where to begin because the information sh who enforces the quiet policy with deadly seriousness. Teo is relieved he didn't accidentally make a sound. Shin explains that the librarian is named Mei, and she despises any noise in her territory. The penalties for making noise vary depending on the volume. A sneeze could result in death, while just being loud might lead to broken limbs. As a silver-ranked spy, Mei is someone Teo cannot defeat in a direct fight. His best chance is to avoid her, but this will be challenging since she patrols the library silently. As long as Teo remains silent, he should be safe. Even his earpiece is at risk of annoying Mei, so Shin reduces its volume as much as possible. As Teo sneaks around the library, he witnesses Mei take out a man simply because she didn't like his face. That seems particularly unfair to Teo. Teo continues searching the library as more and more people are killed for making even the slightest noise. At one point, Teo accidentally drops a book while searching, which would be enough to get him killed. Fortunately, he catches it before it makes any noise, much to the relief of everyone around. Despite his efforts, Teo struggles to find anything because of the library's complex organization. Eventually, he discovers a folder containing civilian records from the past 10 years. Inside, he finds his father Heida Sano's records, but the file provides no useful information. Feeling disappointed that he risked his life for nothing, Teo notices a slot in the book for an optical storage device. He inserts the device, and the book's pages transform to reveal a file stating that Teo's family was eliminated by Tenpopo. Suddenly, the book initiates a self-destruct sequence, and within seconds, it explodes. The explosion is deafening, prompting Shin to warn Teo that Mei will be coming for him. Teo manages to dodge Mei's initial attack. Following Shin's instructions, he fires an electrical blast at an outlet, causing the entire library to lose power. Under the cover of darkness, Shin urges Teo to run. However, Mei quickly catches up to him, as she can track him by the sounds his body makes. As Mei prepares to kill Teo, Shin tells him to turn and run into a nearby corridor. Matsumi then comes up with an idea. She instructs Teo to remove his earpiece and point it at Mei. When he does, Matsumi raises the volume to the maximum and screams into the mic, knocking Mei out. Matsumi had deduced that Mei must be extremely sensitive to sound, which is why she reacts so violently to disturbance. The high-quality earpiece overwhelmed Mei's ears, causing her to pass out. Despite the near-death experience, Teo gains a clue about his parents' killers. He later goes to Kyo for help in tracking down Tenpopo. However, Kyo uses the opportunity to vent his frustrations on Teo. While Teo is tied up, Kyo reveals that he has heard of Tenpopo before and that Teo's family wasn't their only victim. They also killed Matsumi's mother. Kyo has used every resource available to the Yasukura family to track down Tenpopo but hasn't found any solid leads yet. Kyo explains that Tenpopo is a powerful organization targeting Matsumi, and all their members have dandelion tattoos on their hands. Despite his frustration, Teo asks Kyo not to take it out on him. Kyo calms down and thanks Teo for his recent revelation about Tenpopo's involvement in his parents' deaths, which helped narrow down his search. Kyo discovered that around the time Teo's family died, 15 other medical professionals died in similar accidents. All of these individuals had interactions with the director of the Kawashita Clinic, Makoto. While Makoto may not be the mastermind, he is definitely involved. Tanpopo killed Matsumi's mother, Teo's family, and now they are after Matsumi as well. Kiyo asks Teo if he would join him in exposing the truth about Tanpopo, and Teo readily agrees. To gather more information, Teo goes undercover at the Kawashita Medical Clinic as an old man with chronic lung disease, with Matsumi posing as his elderly wife. Matsumi enjoys playing her role, but she becomes concerned when Teo genuinely starts acting like an old man. When she inquires, Teo explains that Kyo forced him to wear heavy weights on this mission despite the danger. 
Mutsumi decides she will have a word with Kyo when they get home. Keio gets called next, so Mutsumi wheels him over to the doctor, bringing him face to face with Makoto. Makoto conducts a checkup and remarks that everything looks normal, expressing surprise that an old man like Teo still has all his teeth intact. He assures Teo that he will provide the best care possible, and invites him to ask if he needs anything. Later, Teo is taken to his room. None of this makes much sense to Teo, as Makoto seemed genuinely dedicated to ensuring his patients receive good care. Meanwhile, Matsumi enjoys spending time with Teo and acting as his wife. She hopes that in the future, they won't have to deal with assassinations and bounty, and they can spend time like this when they actually grow old. Teo thinks he might like that as well. That night, after Makoto clocks out and heads home, Teo decides to take action. He sneaks into Makoto's office and examines the computer. Despite looking like a regular computer, it contains numerous empty folders that seem out of place, a spotless browser history, and unnecessarily high security systems. Using some tech he borrowed from Shin, Teo scans the hard drive and finds files related to something called the Soma Yoshino Project. These files reveal that the Yasukura family's superhuman abilities are due to a protein called Samanai, produced by the Yasukura family head's body. This protein allows family members to develop superhuman senses and ability at an early age. Moreover, Samanine is an effective doping agent for normal people and can be synthetically produced. To mass-produce it, Tenpopo needs the natural source of the protein, Matsumi Yazakura's heart. Shocked by this revelation, Teo is suddenly ambushed by Makoto, who pins him to the ground with a scalpel. Makoto had heard rumors about Teo but is surprised the assassination attempt on him failed. Teo asks if Makoto killed his family and Matsumi's mother, but Makoto dismisses the question, believing Teo will soon be dead. He tries to stab Teo, but the scalpel is blocked by the weights Kyo forced Teo to wear. Teo pushes Makoto off and fires an electric blast at him, but it has no effect. Makoto neutralizes the blast, sets off a flashbang, and escapes with a laptop and all its information. Although disappointed that Makoto managed to get away, Teo is relieved that he copied much of the data onto Shin's flash drive. Now aware of Tenpopo's evil plot, Teo is determined not to let them succeed for Matsumi's sake. This concludes episode 13. Don't forget to subscribe to not miss the next part.